Now, one reason, typically, one reason that I do not um, tape at home on Tuesdays and or on Mondays and Thursdays is my grandson is here right now. He's six months old and, you know, he's a six month old, so he cries occasionally. Hopefully that's not going to be an issue today. All right. We'll just we're going to do the best we can. So let me bring this up. Uh, if one if anybody who's out there listening if you could just please send a message out on teams that just says you can hear me i'd appreciate it just so i'm sure that indeed this is making it through to somebody all right, so I'm on chapter 10 in the book. All right, and I'm on page 303. Chapter 10 is on, the first part of it is on five controls, some of which we've talked about, some of which we haven't talked about yet. Most of the applications we've been creating thus far have contained labels, text boxes, and buttons, and not much else. In this chapter, we're going to be introduced to combo boxes, check boxes of uh, radio buttons list boxes and group box controls even though we've looked at some of those previously all right now what they have in here is i'm going to bring up hopefully i have it so it looks like okay again oh there it is this is the application that they have in the book in the chapter. All right, Physio Studio Glow is automatically closed. Sure. All right, so I believe at least this is the application that they have uh, in the book for chapter 10. To run this, no, 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 no. All right, now let's see if it comes up. All right, good. This is what is in the book. All right. So if I come through here, you'll notice if I, for instance, say Mike, Mike James, select payment. All right. What I want to show you from here is the following. This right here is a drop down list right there. That is a drop down list. Let me cancel this and you'll notice it has some names in it. All right. This, I believe at least, is a list box that's grayed out right now. All right. The buttons you know about, but in here, these are radio buttons. All right. And that are inside of a group box. So if I choose credit card, as you can see, I have to come in here in this list box and pick out the type of credit card that I have. So if I change it, you know, I can change it to any one of these three. If I click the other one, which says bill customer, you'll notice that virtually all this stuff will now be grayed out. All right, I can't choose anything that's in here. All right, but if I go back to credit card, I can. So I can come into here, I can change the number, et cetera. There's another two drop down lists right here. One that says select a month, that's got January through December, and one that's got select a year, which has got this year up through about seven or eight years from now, all right? So why am I telling you that? Because as we get explained this information that's in this chapter, all right? Let's see. Okay, as we start to get explained the information 
that is in this chapter, I'll be able to go back to that program and talk about some more of this stuff. All right. When we get done with that, we're going to go in and take a look at multi form projects. We haven't really done very much where we've got more than one form. I'm going to show you how you can do that. It's really not difficult. I've got a couple problems or a couple things here, and I'll put all these out online by the end of the day. All right, so you can take a look at them. Then we will go into the message box class, and guess what? There's not going to be a boatload you're going to learn from that because we've been using the message box class. The way they show you in here is pretty much the way that I have been using it with you for the entire semester. We will talk about the forum closing event. All right, and then we will look at this payment app. So let's get into it. So as they say, five more types of controls. Let's do this. All right, rather than even bringing this one up right now, I think this might make a little bit more sense. All right, at least I'm hoping it makes a little bit more sense. And that is, I'm gonna start up another session of Visual Studio. All right, I'm gonna create a new project. I've already started to do some work on this, but I didn't finish it, all right, because of my network problems. But I'm gonna come in here and I'm just gonna call this demo. I'm probably going to end up getting rid of it anyway, but it's just going to be called demo. All right, and it's in a folder called controls demo where I'm creating another project for you. All right, so I'm going to come in here. I'm going to make this nice and big. All right, and. I'm going to change the background color. So it's a little easier to see. All right, and I'll just call this FRM demo. All right, so what I want to show you are each one of the different things that are oh brother that are explained in this chapter okay i don't know what the heck is going on it, it's like the rest of my day but it's fine all right we won't change the, the name of the form now you're used to this you're used to me coming in here and creating you know three buttons, most of the time, three buttons. Okay, so I come in here and we have, usually at least, when we do this, we have some kind of a calculate button, some kind of a clear button, and some kind of an exit button. I'm not gonna worry about those right now, all right? You know that typically when we want to input something, we use a text box, all right? something like that yeah and to make sure we've got some kind of a heading or label for it we typically come in there with a label again there's nothing new here so far so if i come in here there's my label that's the way we've been doing things by and large for the pretty much the entire semester all right but there's a lot more that you can do and a lot more that you can work with on here and that's what the subject of this chapter is. So let's get into that, all right? So the first thing I'm going to bring up here is a group box control. I think we've looked a little bit at a group box before. Whether we did or we didn't doesn't really matter. I'm gonna go over to my controls here and I'm gonna find group box. There it is. It comes in and it pretty much is a transparent box. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that transparent box and I'm going to make it the same color as my labels, just so you can see what I'm working with. All right. Now, let's imagine that we're creating in this application, we're going to create our own little form in here. All right. And it's going to be an internet type of form, type of an idea. Okay. So if you say, I don't know what you mean, just bear with me for a minute. Okay. All right. So as we come in here and we start doing this, we're just going to imagine for a second that this is going to be the first name with the text box, and then we'll have a last name. All right, that's pretty obvious, and you do that kind of stuff a lot. Then here, this is going to be the group box. So I'm going to call it GB for group box, GB, and I'm going to put in here gender because it's an easier one to work with. 
and I will put into the text gender. Now it's very small in here. It's very hard for you to read. OK, so let's go and make all this the way that we usually do things. So let's come in here. All right, well, now that's pretty big. It's actually bigger than I need. So I'm going to take where it says gender and I'm going to knock the size down from. 20 to about 14 and that's plenty big. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in three what are called radio buttons. All right, and I'm just going to take them. I'm going to grab them from over here and I'm going to drag them in. They'll be the first one. All right, and I've got two choices. I can either just do a control C, control V to copy, or I can go back up here and I can drag this back in as well. So now I have three radio buttons. All right, and with these three radio buttons, what they're going to represent are possible genders. OK, with radio buttons, I always preface mine with rad, R-A-D. So this will say R-A-D female. All right, and I'm going to go down to the text and I'm going to put in there female. All right, you can see what happened. Then I'm going to go to the next one. And I'm going to make that R-A-D male. And we will put in for the text mail. All right, and then finally for the last one, we're just going to put in, we're trying to be politically correct here. So R-A-D other. All right, and we'll put in there other. OK, now we've done nothing as far as writing a lick of code, not a thing. Totally fine. All right, but what I want to show you is this. If I come in now and run this program. OK, these are already set up, so only one of them can be selected at a time. So when I select one of them, whatever other one might be pre-selected is now unselected. These are based off of the old AM radios that were in cars back when I was your age. All right. And you had five typically radio buttons that you could pre-program. You could click one of the buttons and it would play that AM radio station. All right, that's kind of what we're doing right now. And it's up to you when you set this up. If you don't like the way this looks, as an example, we could have also done this. So I could have just taken this, moved that over here, taken that and moved it over there, for example. All right, it's going to work the same way. Some people like to take their radio buttons like this and they like to have them more horizontal up and down and or, or uh, side to side like this and some like it vertical. It really and truly doesn't matter. Now, if you're going to do something like this, then typically, all right, as an example, I might go into, there's two ways I can do this. I can go into my form load event right here. OK, so there's my form load, so I can go in there and I can say uh, I can call it something called initialize. I'm making this up. All right, not initialize component, just initialize. All right, and then I can write this routine called initialize. And I can say rad female. It's the first one dot checked equal true. That'll make sure that when the program starts, that button is checked. Since that button is checked, I can now be 100% assured that one of these will always be checked. Always. Now, sometimes what you see is rather than doing this and this, people don't do it like that. And what I mean is they want to do some initialization at the beginning of the program. All right, so they come up here and where we say initialize component underneath that they're going to write another routine. So I'm going to call this initialize.
gender as an example. OK, no, that doesn't exist. So I'm going to come right down here and I'm going to say private void initialize. Gender. All right, and just like we had before, I'll just grab this line. And I'll put it here. Now, I'm not trying to confuse you, but I'm telling you sometimes people do their initialization up here. And sometimes people do their initialization inside a form load. All right. In the end, it's going to work out the same way. So it really doesn't matter which one we use. But when the program starts now, I can always be 100% assured that the female is always going to be selected by default. All right. If I didn't do that, so let's take that line and let's comment it out and run the program again. Now you'll notice none of them are selected and you might think, yeah, I, I get it. Big deal. It actually is a big deal because right now, if I wanted to make sure one of them was selected, all right, I'd have to go through and write code to do that. But by me coming in here and doing this, now I can be 100% assured one of these radio buttons will always be selected. All right. Now you'll notice that this has got a property called checked. All right. So any time that I come in here and I check on one of those radio buttons, it the checked property will become true. So when we set this at the beginning that you just saw, when we did that, all right, automatically the system did this. Rad male dot checked equal false and rad other dot checked equal false. That was done for me automatically because only one of these can be checked at a time. All right. Now, what else do you need to know about radio buttons? Well, first of all, if I want to now, because I gave it a little bit more room. So let's see if I can make these a little bigger so they stand out like the other stuff does. All right, so let's see if we can make this 20. Whoops, not 200. There, so that's a little bit easier to see now. All right, but you get the idea, or at least hopefully, you get the idea. <clears throat> now, if I click on a radio button, doesn't matter which one, and I go over here, all right, and I click on events, that lightning bolt, these are all the different things that a radio button can answer. You'll notice that the default event is check changed. That's the one that fires anytime I click on a radio button. So if the program is running, and you, as you see right here, female is selected. So if I click on here, the check changed for rad male becomes true. The check changed or that, you know, the checked becomes true for here. The check becomes false for here and for here. So when you've got what are called mutually exclusive choices, where only one of them makes sense, all right, that's when you typically will go in and you will use radio buttons. All right, so I've explained to you radio buttons and I've explained to you a little bit about group boxes. One more thing, just so you know this, about group boxes. That is, notice if I click, I'm going to click on here, try to see if I can highlight just the group box here. Okay, there it is. Notice if I move it, these are inside. A group box is a container. All right. Since it's a container, when I move the group box, everything inside of the group box moves as well. So that's the first one. Let's take a look then at a list box. All right. So I'm going to go to list box. There it is. All right. And there's different things I can put in here. There's different ways I can fill this up, etc. 
Well, um, the first thing I'm going to do with the group box here is I'm going to I'm going to change so it's again tw size 20. All right. All right. List boxes, I typically could start mine with LST. Some books will show you LB for list box, but I'm going to call this LST names. And what I'm going to put in here are the names of all five members of my family. All right. And you'll notice that in here it says LST names. And if I go down in here, okay, there is no property that says text. I can't change that. But what I can do is I can add names to this, and I'm going to show you two different ways, three different ways that we can add names here. All right. The first is I can add them at design time. I can click on the list box. I can go over to here to where it says items and it says collection. If I click there, I get this ellipsis. And if I click on the ellipsis, now I can start entering names. Jeff, Sandy, Taylor, Mackenzie, and Chloe. Those are the five members of my family. And you'll notice when I click OK, there they are. Now, there was nothing magical, nothing fantastic or whatever about that, but I'm showing you that it is possible in a list box to go in and pre-populate it by going into items and in, in the collection. All right, so that's one way, but I'm going to remove those, and I'm going to show you a couple of other ways to do it. All right, so let's say that you saw this before. We had this initialize gender. All right. I'm going to call this in oops, initialize list box. Of course, it's going to give me an error because I haven't written it yet, but I'm going to write it in just a second. All right. So another way that I can do this in code is I can have the name of my list box, whoops, which was LST names, and I can say dot items, dot add, and I'll put me in there. All right, so there's me, my wife, and my three daughters. All right, and again, if I come in here now and run this, what you're going to notice is there's my names. OK, they're in there, so this is how I can do it programmatically. Now, if you know everything that's going to go into the list box ahead of time, you might want to pre-fill it by using one of these two methods. Sometimes you don't know ahead of time. So in other words, if this was first name here, and this was last name, what if I want to add them like that? Let's see if we can do that. So I'm going to come back to here, and I'm going to change this. All right, and this is going to be LBL first name. And it'll say first name. All right, this will be LBL last name and it'll say last name in just a moment. All right, and this will be TXT first name. And this will be TXT last name. All right, now what I'm going to try to show you here, I'm going to do this off the top of my head, but it should work out OK. All right, uh, let's lock our controls. I've, I've started to rename all this stuff, but I didn't do these, so let's do these quickly.
right? For right now, I don't care about clear. I don't care about exit. I only care about calculate here. And what I want to do is when I come in and put in a first name here and put in a last name here and I click calculate, I want to see if I can get it to appear in here. I want to say this again. I want to. When I click calculate, I want to see if there's a name in here and there's a name in here. So if they're both filled out, then I want to put that into here, the name, first name and the last name. So let's see if we can do that. All right. Well, what have we been doing? I can do this with a try catch, but I'm just going to do it simplistically like this. You know, are there old bool keep going equal verify first name exists? All right, you've seen this kind of thing many times before. So private bool verify <clears throat> first name exists. All right, so bool retval equal true if uh, LST, not LST, I'm sorry, if txt first name dot text equal e dot trim, we'll put in dot trim. If that's equal to nothing, all right, we'll just put in a message box. You must enter a first name. And we'll say here, no first name input. All right. And then what we'll do is we will say txt first name dot focus and we'll return, we'll set ret val equal to false. This should be nothing new here. Otherwise, and then we'll return red fail. All right, so now I should be able to come in here. And if this is empty. OK, no first name input, you must enter a first name, so nothing new there. All right, let's copy this. So I'm going to say if. And I'm going to come in here and do this if keep going. Keep going. Equal and now we're going to verify last name exists. And we're going to do the same kind of thing we just did, so I'm going to copy this entire routine here and now put it as verify. Last name exists. OK. So let's see. Somehow I lost a curly brace. There it is. So we're going to do last name. All right, so that at least should be now done. Now, if I come in here and don't have a first name, you already, whoops, you already saw this. That if we didn't have a first name, what doesn't it like here? Verify first name exists. Verify last name exists. Somehow I lost my return red fail. Okay, try it again. So if there's no first name, we get the message. You must enter a first name, no first name input. So if I put in a first name, then it's going to check for last name. OK, and if I put in a last name. As of right now, nothing's going to happen because I haven't told it to yet. So let's get rid of these and see once we put this in, if we can put it into here. All right. So I do want to come in and where we said this. Initialize this, I'm just going to comment these names out. All right, or I could leave them in and comment out the initialize list box. Either way would work. All right, but what I want to do now is again. Else. Return. And here if keep going. 
I'm going to attempt right now and doing this off the top of my head, so I hope the heck it works. I'm going to do another routine that says copy. Copy first and last names to list box. All right, so we're going to attempt to do that. And that's only going to happen if our first name was validated and our last name was validated. All right, so this is what I want to do. So I'm going to come in here and say string. Uh, we'll say first equals txt first name dot text dot trim. All right, string last equals that. And then we'll have string. I've been using output str, and that'll be equal to, well, what do we want to do? Well, let's use string interpolation in here. And we'll put in first with a blank space after it, and then last. All right. And at least as far as I can tell, that should work. Now we can we, we can just make sure why I'm just going to put in a message box dot show right here and I'll put in output str. Okay, I don't care about a heading or anything. I just want to see if this is working. So I have put in here Jeff. I'll put in here. You must enter a last name. Yes, that's true. Scott. Calculate Jeff Scott. So that's working. So now I want to transfer that to here. OK, how do I do that? It really and truly is not difficult. I want to say. LST, the name of my list box. LST names dot items dot add. And then I want to add that output. STR, what I just showed you. So let's see if indeed that works. OK. Now you know how squirrely I am about a lot of this stuff, so I am going to align this. There we go, and let's try it. So as of right now, I believe you'd all agree there's nothing in there. So let's see if I put in Jeff. Scott, I haven't set tab order or anything in here, but there it is. Now that what was that that fantastic? No, but what I'm trying to let you know is that there is a, a correlation typically between all of these controls that we end up putting in here. All right, so if I come in and, you know, there's no clear in here right now, but if I put in All right, now they're all in there. Well, what if, what if when I click clear, I want this to clear out? I want to get rid of everything that's in there. When I click clear, let's see if we can do that. All right, so when I click clear, I'll want these to both clear out and I'll want this to clear. Okay, and then maybe I also want this to get set back to female. All right. So I'm going to put all that in there. So again, we'll call our clear form. All right, and let's just do them in order. So txt first name dot text equals nothing. Txt last name dot text equal nothing. All right, now to clear out that list box, it's right here for me lst.items.clear, and then finally, well, we've already got a routine that we wrote way up on top here called initialize gender, so why don't we just call that routine? Just like that. So let's see if all of this works. I'm going to run it. I'm going to put in, a, let's just put in two names.
and we'll put in John's wife, Jane. There we go. So now I'm going to click other right here. OK, and if I want to, if I click clear, this should clear, this should clear, these should clear out, and this should go back to female. And you see everything's working. All right, now, if we're going to do this, and I want to put in this and this, and I'll click this, maybe I also want to put this in there. Let's see if we can add that. All right. Let's see. Um, so I'm adding all this stuff in here. I'm going to try to go back to Google here because I want to make sure I'm doing it right. I know one way to do it, but I thought there's a better way than. Let's see. Yeah, that's what I thought it might have to be. OK, that's fine. All right, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say I'm going to put an if statement in that says if rad female dot checked. OK, then I'm going to add output str. Dash. Well, it's female. OK, not maybe the best way of doing this, but let's it's, it's the way I'm going to do it. And I lost my output string. Great. All right. What we had in here before was we had string output str equals. And what we had in here was we used string interpolation. And we had first with a space and then last. All right, what I'm going to attempt to add to that now is dash female, dash male, or dash other. All right, I guess I had it down here, so. Let's see if that works. John Doe male. And if we do Jane, Jane Doe female. Oh, it's got female and it's got others. Well, that isn't good, so we'll have to fix that. That's fine. Rad male. Okay, this should be an else if rad other I checked. Let's run it again. Jane Doe female. John Doe male. And hello Doe, which is other. So all of that's working. OK, and what I'm trying to show you in here is how we can check to see whether or not a radio button has been selected. This is not the only way of doing this, but this is a way of doing it. All right. So, so far, what we've looked at in here is we looked at the group box, we looked at radio buttons, and we looked at the list box. All right. Well, then let's go in here. And what I'm going to put in here next, 
you don't need to put into a into a group box. I want to say this again. What I'm going to put in next, I'm going to use a group box, but it doesn't have. To, I don't need a group box. And if you say, what do you mean? Just if you would watch for a second, hopefully it'll make sense. So I'm going to create another one of these, make it about that big. All right, again, I'll make it the same color. All right, and I'm going to call this. Shift desired. All right, and again, I'll make the size of that about 12. All right, let's let's make this actually we'll make it about the same size as the other one. Now I'm going to add three check boxes. All right. There's a second one. And there's a third one. All right. Usually most people start check boxes with CHK. So CHK first shift. And I'm going to put in there for the text. First. Shift. All right, I'm going to make that bigger in a second. This one will be. CHK second. Shift. And the last one, as you probably guess, will be third shift, and it'll be called CHK third shift. All right, let's make these bigger. I don't remember if I made the other ones 20 or not, but I'm going to try that. What size was that? Well, it says 20, but this did not get changed for some reason. So let's see if we can change them like this. There we go. Now that's a little cramped, so I can take these and move them over. And again, that's not terrific, but it's okay. It does what I want it to do. Now, what you'll notice when you look at these and you start working with them is in most ways, most of the things that you do, uh, most of the methods, etc., that run for radio buttons also run true for checkboxes with one big exception. I want to say this again, with one big exception. All right. And the exception to this is these are mutually exclusive. These are not. So I've got my choice. All right. I could have even added another one that says no preference, for example. So we could make this wider. All right. If we wanted to look at I'm not even going to add that. But the, what I'm trying to show you is when we run this. Notice I can check all of them. I know it doesn't come out real well. You don't see it that well, but we can run all of them. All right. And now if I wanted to go and add those to here, well, first of all, I'm going to have to make this a little bit wider, I think. So let me come in here and move this over and let me move. So let's make this wider. OK. And so far we've got our names in there and we've got our genders. Well, let's also. Put our shifts in there. All right, see if we can get that, because if we can get that, then what's left is a combo box, which we'll do next. But then we've talked about group boxes. We've talked about radio buttons. We've talked about list boxes. We've talked about check boxes. So that's four of the five that are in here. All right, so let's go back to calculate here. 
Now, if you notice, we verified all this stuff. We don't have to verify anything because when you are working with a checkbox, all right, when you are working with a checkbox, um, it's possible that nothing is checked. All right, so I've got copy first and last names to checkbox, to list box rather. Let's put in here copy desired shifts to list box. And again, it hasn't been written yet. So I'll write it right down below the one we just did. Okay. All right. Now, we've already got a lot of the same stuff in here that we need. Okay. The problem that we have right now is this output string that we're putting in here, this output string, it's we're declaring it here. Since we're declaring it right here, we either, you know, well, we're printing it out here, but what about this stuff that we're going to put in here? All right, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take our output string and I'm going to make that global. So I'm going to say here, as we've done several times, declare and initialize class variables. So I'll have string output S str equals nothing. All right. Now, as far as C sharp is concerned, I don't get an error here. But it thinks that this is a brand new output string and I want to use the one I made global. So all I have to do is that. All right. And this list thing in here. I'm going to move that down to here now. I'm not done yet, though. OK. I'm going to go and copy in those if statements that I just put in, but I'm going to make changes to them. All right. Instead of saying if rad female checked, I'm going to say if CHK first shift dot checked. And they made that a big I. I shouldn't have. But we can add on to this. We'll just put in here space first. All right. But remember, you can check multiple ones. OK, so we'll put in here first. And now we'll say if CHK second shift dot checked and we'll add to this second and then we'll say if CHK third shift is checked, we'll add to this third. All right, now we can add this stuff in there. OK, I'm going to make just fix this one in just a second by going back to here. And manually changing that to a I that is lowercase. That should change it in my code as well. All right, so now we've come in here and let's see if it's all working. So we've got John Doe. Who's a male and wants to, he'll, he'll take any shift. Okay, calculate. So John Doe male, first, second, third. All right, if we've got Mary Doe or Jane Doe, let's say, and Jane's a female, she does not want to work. For, she's a night person, so she only wants to work third shift. So you can see what's happening here. What I'm doing is I'm grabbing. I'm showing you how you can grab the information from a form and you can put it into something. Now, what we're doing here is we're putting it into a list box. We could have put this into a message box just as easily. There would have been no problem at all doing that. All right now. I want to do one more thing here because I have now shown you radio buttons, group boxes, check boxes, and list boxes. So the one I have not shown you yet, the one I have not shown you is a drop down list or also known as a combo box. So we're going to put that right here. Okay. So I'm going to find combo box here. 
There it is. This is this one's a little harder to work with, but I'm going to explain everything to you. What I want to have happen, what I want to have happen now to show you whether or not this will work, I start my combo boxes with CBO. So I'm going to say CBO name. I'm just going to leave it at name. All right, and I'm going to change the size like I've done with the other ones. And you can see it got a little chunkier. But when I put all this in there, I want the name to appear in here. I want the name to appear in the box here. All right, let's see if we can get that to happen. So now, right now when we calculate, we verify there's a first name. We verify there's a last name. All right, if both are in there, we copy the first and last names to the list box. We copy the shifts to the list box. Nothing new there. You've already seen all those. All right, but let's also come in and let's copy first and last names to combo box, which again doesn't exist, so we'll write it right now. All right, so what we want to do is use the name of our combo box. So CBO name should have probably been names, but that's OK. Dot items. All right, dot add. And what do I want to add in there? Well, OK, the problem I'm going to have right now, the problem that I'm going to have is if I add it, it's going to say first male, female, etc. And I don't really want that to happen. How can I fix that? I'll show you right now. All right, I'm going to put in here, just so you see it, I'm going to put in here output STR. Now, it's not going to work right now the way I want it to work, but I want to show you. We'll fix it in just a second. So I'll come in and I'll put in John Doe. John's a male. Wants first shift, we'll click calculate. All right, you see nothing happened here. Yes, it did. We put it in there as well. All right, now, I don't want that. I only want John Doe to go in there. So how can I do that? Maybe you even figured it out already. And that is, okay, I've got here, output string equal first and last. What if I call this routine, copy first and last names to combo box, what if I call that right after I set the first name and the last name? Now let's see what it does. So we'll put Jane in here. She's a female. We'll give her all three shifts. And we'll click calculate. All right, so she's that's all in there. And now there's her name. All right. What I'm trying to get across to you is when you work with radio buttons or you work with check boxes, the check is kind of the check and check changed is kind of the magical thing that's in here that allows you to do things. In the same way, when you worked with list boxes and with combo boxes, it's pretty much again in here that you fill them up in the same way. You use the items property. Now, if you remember before in here, when we had our clear, this is how we cleared out that list box. Let's see if the combo box can be cleared the same way. All right. So we'll put in two names. We'll put in again our John Doe and our Jane Doe. Okay, there's John and there's John. All right, and then we'll put in Jane. Okay, 
there's Jane and there's Jane. If I click clear, all right. There we go. They're both clear. All right, so you, hopefully what you're starting to see is a lot of similarity between the way these two controls work and the way these two controls work. All right, that's what I'm, for now at least, that's what I'm trying to get across to you. So let's jump back into the book because I've given you a lot of the information that's already in the chapter. All right, they mention in there, Um, combo box lets the user select an item from a list of items. Now, you know what, what would be cool right here, and we're going to get to this just not right now, but what would be cool would be when we come in here to run this. If I came in here and let's say I had a list of names, if I click Jane Doe, that it would fill all these up. And yes, you can do that. That'll be more when we get into talking about databases. All right, but yeah, you can do that. So you can go the other way. So as opposed to filling it up, filling all these up, clicking calculate and filling these two up, like I've shown you, we could do it the other way, where if we had some names in here or in here already, we could either choose one from here or choose one from here, and we could fill this up accordingly. And we're gonna get into all of that stuff. All right, not right now, but we will get into all of that stuff. All right. So you use a combo box to let the user select one item from a list of items. All right, like a combo box, a list box lets the user select an item from a list of items. All right, with a list box, it's typically bigger. So you typically can see all of your items or at least a, a great majority at one time. All right, with a combo box, typically most of it is hidden. All right, now did you notice here that when we ran this, there was a difference between these. So if I put in here John Doe and male and second shift, it filled that up and it is here, but by default, it shows nothing, all right? It looks as though it was empty. What if I don't want that? One thing I wanna show you in here is, then this is unique to combo boxes, that if I come back in here and I go and click on the combo box, there is a thing here that says drop down style. And right now it's a drop down, but I can also choose simple, which is going to show all of them basically, and I don't think I've ever used that, and a drop down list. All right, let's see how different that looks. It went gray, as you can see. I didn't make it gray. So, all right, and it's still in there. They pretty much act the same. But one thing I want you to understand is when you're working with these, either one of these, it's an items collection. So in other words, this is item zero, so is this. If there's nothing in there, the index for this, if there's nothing here, so if I click this, okay, so right now, the index for this is set to negative one because there is nothing. And the index there is set to negative one. If I had one value like I just showed you, then the index would be zero. All right. The reason that that is important is going to become more apparent as we go on and look at a few other things that are in here. All right. So jump back into the book here. So radio buttons give you a, a mutually exclusive selection only one at a time, and check boxes are a way that you can select things that are not mutually exclusive. All right. So this is the one I brought this up at the beginning of class. This is that payment thing that we looked at earlier. 
So now, hopefully, at least, you can look at that and understand. All right, you can understand what radio buttons are, what a group box is, what a list box is, and what these combo boxes are, because we, and a checkbox, because we did all of them. All right, I'm not going to read these. You can read them yourselves. It's just a summary of what I've gone over with you already. All right. So they start to mention here, these are some of the things with combo boxes and list boxes. All right, well, what's in here? Okay, well, if you remember from before, if you remember from before, let's do this. Let's run this again. And it's gonna be, take, give me a, just a second, put everything in here I wanna put in here. So you can see how everything is going in there. It's all working. All right. But there is a property that you can use on this. I'm just going to show it to you right here. And that is this. So when I put these things into where are we? Um, when I click on here, when I click on there, there's a property down here that is called sorted and it's set to false. I'm going to set it to true and I'm going to run exactly what you just saw a second ago. And what I mean is I'm going to put me in there. All right, now I'm going to put in uh, my daughter. All right, I'm going to put in one of my other daughters. And then my wife. All right. Now you say nothing happened. Well, look. And you'll notice these are all it's by first name, not last, but they're all in alphabetic order. So there is a sorted property that you can use with these that sometimes comes in nice. All right. Now, selected index, I've already mentioned if the list box or the combo box is empty, then the selected index automatically has a value of negative one. If you have nothing selected, it has a value of negative one. So it's the index. If you've got one name in there and you select it, then the selected index has a value of zero. The item, all right, is the item itself. All right. The text is the text for the item. Sorted, I've already shown you. Items, I've already shown you. I showed you drop down style. Selection mode is a different one. All right. Usually, selection mode will be set to one, meaning you can only select one item at a time. There's also two other things that you can choose multi simple or multi extended. With multi simple, all right, that means that you can select multiple items, but they have to be physically connected to each other in the combo box or in the list box. Multi extended means they don't have to be physically connected to one another. All right. And here are the two events that are most often associated with these selected index changed, and that's when you change a different item or select a different item from the list. All right, and text changed when you enter a value into a text box of a combo box. We're not even going to go through that right now. All right, then when you are working with the members of the items, you can see the stuff that's in here. I already showed you add, which added it to the list. There is an insert. So if you don't want to add it to the end like add does, you can use insert. There's a remove, which gets rid of everything. 
All right. Usually you use clear for that. There's a remove at where you can remove just one. All right. Let's continue on. So there's a bunch of examples in here. These are actually, believe it or not, this is from the program that's in the book and they're cool examples. What do I mean? Well, notice what they have here. This is a string array. So in zero, we've got select a month. That means January is one, February is two, and December is 12. If we left that select a month off and we didn't put anything up there, January would be zero, February would be one, December would be 11. So they've set up a string array here, and then they're iterating their way through the array, and that's gonna fill up the combo box. So it will fill it up in this case with the 12 values each month. All right, and then we've got another one here for years. Now this one is probably a little bit more programmatic, because we're working with numbers. So what you're doing here is you're going from whatever year you've entered, all right, up until eight years past that. So that's why if you notice that at the beginning, when we brought this thing up, all right, when we brought this up, all right, that when we came here and let me go to we select somebody all right that for example these were automatically these were coded in there and so were these these are the months that i just showed you and current year and then one two three four five six seven all right so the current year and then seven years from that year you could make that as big or as small as you wanted or needed that to be. All right, and then they've got a few more things in here as they usually do. Code that works with a combo box of names. All right, and they show you an insert and they show you a remove at, et cetera. All right, it says here you can also use the string collection editor to load items in. All right, that's what I showed you before when we went into the. Um, when we went into the properties window and I selected items and manually put those in there. So again, it's just another way that you can do this same thing. All right. Then it's check boxes and radio buttons. We've looked at these now. Again, both of them have a checked property that you can set to true or false. True meaning it's checked or it's got the circle in it. All right. And false if it does not. And there's a check changed event. Occurs when the user checks or unchecks a control. Kind of what I've shown you already. Okay. The tab order, this is, I don't know why they waited to hear, but this is how I showed you tab order at the beginning of the semester. When you do a view tab order and you set it. If for some reason you never understood it when we did it, feel free to go back and look at these pages. But this is what I've been doing all semester. All right, how to get information you need for using a control. I cannot do this with my machine because of the software that I'm using with it, you can. What do I mean? Let's suppose for a second, let's bring this back up. And let's suppose you wanted to know more. You're a little confused about exactly what these checkboxes are. If you highlight a checkbox like this and up at the top of your, of your keyboard, if you hit the F1 key, it's, it brings up the Microsoft help that there is for a checkbox. If you did it for a radio button and hit F1, it would bring you that up for a radio button, etc. Again, that is incompatible with what I'm using right now. Right? I cannot do that. Okay.
So next is working with multi-form projects. And what I'm going to do here is rather, rather than building these, I'm going to show you a couple of completed projects. All right, they're, they're both very simple, so I don't think you're going to miss anything from this. But let's see. I don't know which one this is, so give me a second here. This is the real simple one. All right. Yeah, that's OK. OK, it's not OK, so let's go back to the other one. Form. No. Did I save it? This should be it here. All right. I made this program. Some people think it's cool. I, it's just, it's not cool. It's just a little thing to show you this. Okay, what I want to do is run this. Okay, there it is. If I click red, if I click white, if I click blue, if I'm blue, I can go back to white. If I'm blue, I can go back to red. If I'm white, I can go to blue. If I'm white, I can go to red. And with any of these, I can exit. All right, so what's so cool about that? Well, it's not that anything is cool about it, but just so you know, every one of those is a form. So I've got this one right here that I called FRM main. That's this one. That's this one here. OK, I've also got. FRM blue and I've got FRM red and I've got FRM white. And what is magically allowing me to go from one of these forms to the other form? Let's take a look at the code. All right, so I'm now I'm in the main form, the yellow one. OK, and if I want to go to the red one, this is what I do. Let's go over these three lines of code. The first line says to hide the current form, make it invisible. Then I create a new instance of the red form. Form, I can call this whatever I want. I could have just called it red. All right. And then I tell it to show that one. So for the white, hide, make a new white form and show it. For the blue, hide, make a new blue form and show it. So there's nothing, all of these are going to be the same. And what I'm trying to tell you is the way that you do this. So if I bring up a different one, if I bring up white here and I bring up the code. All right, red, hide, make a new red and show it. Main, hide, make a new main form and show it, etc. So you can see, hopefully at least, what's happening in here. All right, now when you look at this, when you look at this one right here, okay, this is working with multiple forms, red, white, blue. Pretty obvious, hopefully. Now, what if I didn't want to do that? All right, this is what we had been doing previously. So I'm going to I'm going to close all this. And I'm going to open up the other one. I guess I do have it here. Or I think I do. All right. And in here, all that's happening is if I click the red button, I'm telling the background color to change to red. If I click the white button, I'm telling the background color to change to white. If I click the blue button, I'm telling the background color to change to blue. All right, and notice I'm using in here this dot back color. So that's the background color. That's the same thing as if I went into my properties window here. Oops. If I went into my properties window here, 
and selected the back color right there. It's the same thing. OK, just so I mean, so you're aware of that. It is the exact same thing that we're doing there. All right, for back color. The only difference is now if I run this one. There's not four forms. There is only one form. So let me set the startup project. And now notice it's the same form changing colors. Oops. So there's nothing special about it. The, I guess the only thing that we really haven't talked about on that before is this is one way of changing form color programmatically. OK. And this is, I believe the A in here is alpha, and this is red, green, blue. And when you do this, this is a number between 0 and 255. 0 means total absence. 255 means total saturation. So this one here means no red, no green, all the blue you can give me. The white one is all the red, all the green, all the blue, which comes out to white. If I had a black one, I could make it 0, 0, 0. And that would be the absence of red, green, and blue, which would make it black. This is red, so give me all the red you can, total saturation, nothing with green and nothing with blue. All right. So again, the idea is if you want to, if you want to have multiple forms that you hide the form you currently have, you create an instance of the form you want to bring up, and you use the show dialog basically to bring that form up. Now there's one more thing to show you about this. All right, I'm going to go back to the other one, the first one I showed you that has multiple forms in it. This one right here. So let me close the first one and bring this up. All right. Now you may remember this from yesterday. You may not, but I'm going to double click on the program.cs file. And it's telling me that the first form I want to bring up is main. If I change that to FRM blue, for example, watch what happens when I run the program. You'll notice that the first form that comes up is a blue form. All right, so when you have multiple forms, whatever one you put under application.run here, whatever one goes there is the one that will come up and start running first when the program starts running. All right. Now, I mean, why, why does that even matter? OK, well, what we're going to get to not today, but what we're going to get to eventually is we'll build a special form that for a project that we'll create near the end of the semester, and it'll be called the splash screen. All right, it'll be for a bookstore. And when that first form comes up, it'll have a picture of our bookstore in it. And then we can go to different places from there. All right. So what I tried to show you here, and hopefully I didn't miss anything, how to add a form to the project. All right. Here they're showing you that you can also just right mouse click. I mean, we have to bring the form in. You have to create the new form. So in other words, when I came into here, I didn't have all these forms. I only had FRM main. So I had to right mouse click, choose add and go to form right there. Or I could have gone to new item here and put the form in there. OK, so there's different ways that you can do that. So they explain that here. And then they go through in here the code that's generated for the new form. All right, not much to be honest with you. The initialized components and there's stuff that's that's gone into those designer files. All right, now this is probably the most difficult thing. But unless you when you when you loaded the system, unless you put in 10.0 and I put in 8.0, you can't use this anyway. But there is something called a global using directive. And when you do that, it's kind of cool because if you look in here, 
see, if I bring this up, I, my namespace here is all American forms, right? If I bring up a different one, so this is my program, bring this up, and if I look at the code, it's still all American forms. But when you use that using directive, what I could do is I could have two different projects in here or more that use the same namespace. All right. I don't want to get into that because when I've done this in the past, students have found it very confusing. That's why I don't want to get into it. All right. Renaming a form. You should all know how to do that. We've renamed forms several times. All right. And they'll show that in here. Right mouse clicking on it, etc. How to display the first form of an app. That's what I just showed you. Coming in here to our application dot run. How to display a form as a dialogue. Well, you may or may not have noticed, but when we ran this program. This one right here, this isn't mine. This is the one from chapter 10 in the book. When you click here and you choose this and you click select payment. This is another form. This form right here is known as a modal form, M-O-D-A-L. What that means is I cannot do anything with this form until I either click OK here or I click cancel. This form right now is a dialogue. It has total control of the system. All right, you'll notice as soon as I click OK, boom, OK, or cancel. Now I can go back to here and do whatever I want to do. All right. But what I was trying to show you there was if something is modal, it basically has control of the system. All right. Also going along with that, let's bring that one up one more time. You may or may not have noticed if I look on here, there's a minus, which will minimize my form. There is a square, which will maximize. It's kind of ugly right here, but you can see it. And there's an X, which will close it. When we make this modal form up here, and I choose one of these, notice what's gone. Forms themselves. All right, so let me cancel this and let me exit here. And so I want to save it. No. All right. What I want to show you, though, with this form here, the one that's the payment form. I don't know why it's not showing up here, but it's not. Yeah, it's 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 hung, but there is a property for this. So if I go to properties here. OK, again, it's not showing because I can't show the doggone thing. But if I go to payment and I go to properties, there's a thing in here called like maximize and minimize. All right, where you can turn them on or you can turn them off. I think I'm using the right name. Let's look. All right, again, you can see that they're off here. It's control box. All right, as it says, if it's set to false, then nothing shows. If you don't want just the maximize, just the one with the circ the square on it to not show, you can set that to false. If you want the minus sign so they can't minimize it, you can set that one to false. All right, this should look familiar now. All right, they didn't show the hide, but I did in the show dialogue. All right. This one is not going to make sense. This one here on page 328 is not going to make sense until we go through an example. All right, what I'm going to do today, because this period has been so goofed up, is I'm going to go until I get done with this chapter. After I get done with the chapter, I am going to lecture tomorrow. If you normally can't make it on a Friday or whatever, it's understandable. But I'm going to go over the three problems in here tomorrow, starting at 805, and I will be broadcasting from my home. So hopefully there won't be a problem doing that. All right, I'm going to show them all to you before we leave today. 
All right. And I'm going to show you what we're going to be working on next week before we leave today. All right. But you can pass data between forms. Remember this tag property that I showed you in class yesterday? It's pretty much the same thing. But there is a tag property that you can use to take and work, you know, and pass data back and forth. Notice it says here on the bottom here of page, whatever page we're on here, to 329. The tag property provides a convenient way to pass data between forms in a multi-form app. All right, because it's an object type, you must cast it. Don't worry about that. You'll, you're going to see it tomorrow, okay? All right. The message box, this is stuff we've been doing since day one in here. I have I had my show error message. You know, this is what we use for exit. So everything that we've been using is explained in here. The buttons, are, of course, are these. The icon is here. The default button you can set. So you'll notice no was set as the default button there. All right, so meaning you could just hit enter to have that run and the dialogue result, which is up here. There is actually other things that you can use with a message box as well. For instance, there are coordinates that you can use that will set the message box in a, you know, if you want to put it in maybe in the upper left corner in the upper right corner, et cetera. You can do that. All right. How to use the form closing event. Notice that the verbiage right here, and I'm going to keep going. I'm, I'm not giving a break right now. I'm going to keep going until I finish the chapter. There's about 10 pages left, and then we'll be finished for today. All right. Notice that the up here it says form closing event, C-L-O-S-I-N-G. What that means is you're trying to close the form, but the form has not yet been closed. Here's where if you want to, you can put in code that maybe says something to the user. Are you sure you want to close the form now or whatever? But a closing event means it didn't happen yet. There also is a form closed with a C-L-O-S-E-D event, which means that the form indeed has been closed. All right, and that's what they talk about in here. In this example, what they're doing, this is the one from, from the, the book, this payment thing that we've been looking at. They are simulating you being able to save what you're working on. But since we haven't gotten into databases or files yet, you can't really save it, but it's just simulating or it's acting as though it's saving stuff for you and it's putting stuff again in the form closing event. All right, so the rest of the chapter then goes over this payment app. We've gone through most of it, all right? The stuff that's the most important So what you should notice in here is this is what should come up when you start running it. This is the customer form. By now, you should understand that this is a drop down, combo box, whatever you want to call it. Just a button, a button, a button. What do we have here? Well, it looks like this is just a, a label. And this in here looks like, looks like it's just a list box. All right. And then when you come in there and you select the payment, if you select credit card, this is what comes up. All right, you say, well, no, they're the same thing. No, if you select credit card, then what you notice, oh, I got to plug my computer in, just hold on a sec. I've been running on battery for the whole period.
So if you have chosen credit card, this is, this is what comes up and more importantly, everything in here is active. So you can choose a credit card type, change it if you need to, put in whatever you want for a number, and choose an expiration month and year, and whether or not you want to set that as the default billing method. However, if you click bill customer, all right, then you'll notice all of it is grayed out except for the set as default billing method. All right, so as it says in here, the customer name combo box, that's this right there, customer name combo box, lets the user select a customer. The select payment button lets you specify payment information for a customer. Again, if you choose credit card, then you enter that stuff. If the bill customer one is selected, they're not really doing anything with it. All right. You can select on either form again to use that one as the default method. So as I mentioned to you earlier, and it says it right here, this app does not actually save any data. It says in a production app, it would be saved to a database or a file. Well, we don't talk about files till chapter 17. We don't talk about databases until chapter 19. All right. So they've got the property settings right here. I'm not going to go through those, but let's take a look at the code that's in here. All right, so here's what they named everything. That's fine and dandy. But this is what I want you to start understanding. All right, now when you look in here, you should know this by now. This is a global variable. Now I would have put it up here, but they put it down here. Why is it a global variable? because it's defined outside of any method. So it's a Boolean variable called is data saved and you're setting it to true. Then notice in the load event, what they've done in there is they've added those two customers, Mike Smith and Nancy Jones. All right, I showed you how to do that and put it either under the initialized component at the top of your program or to put it in the form, form load event where we actually call our own method to put to fill something in. All right. This says label for the label payment dot text changed. All right. If we back up here. This basically is saying if the text that's in here, I think has changed. All right, if we change names, so basically what we're saying is we may, we're making some kind of changes in here. All right, for a label, it's whenever you change the text that's in there for a combo box or a list box, it's the selected index change. So this means in here, since this is a combo box, you selected a different customer than what you had before. So if you'd selected Mike Jones, you go to or Mike Smith, you go to Nancy Jones or vice versa. And again, if that happens, you set that is data saved to false and you clear out the payment text. All right. Here, as it says, is if the select payment button is clicked. All right. So what does it have in here? It's got the show dial dialogue. You've already seen this. Now we're not doing a hide like I've done. All right. And I, the only reason I want to mention that, this is pretty much exactly what I had when I showed you with the red and the white and the blue, but I didn't do a hide. The difference is on this particular example, they want to show you both screens at the same time. All right, both the one in there that has got the people who, you know, the Mike Jones and Nancy Smith or whatever the heck it is, and the other one, which has the credit card number and all the other stuff or whatever. All right, so there's not a this dot hide in here. All right. Now, when you look in here, it says if the selected if the select button equals dialog result dot OK. All right. Meaning if you chose something, 
we're going to be able to make a change here. This isn't going to make a boatload of sense until we go through an example tomorrow. All right, we've got a, a pretty good example that we'll go through with all this stuff. Save does just that. Even though it's not really saving. All right, the is valid data. It's not the same as what we ran before. All right, notice we're checking if the combo box is equal to negative one, that means you haven't selected a customer. If the payment text is empty, you didn't enter a payment. If the error message isn't empty, then you want to show that there was some kind of an error. All right, so the, what, what we're doing is the same type of thing, but the code is a little different. This is the code then for the payment form. And again, my goal right now is for you to be able to start understanding some of this. So here we're filling up that list box with Visa, MasterCard, and American Express. Then notice this. It sets our credit card type dot selected index to zero. You may or may not have noticed when we ran that and we went to credit card, Visa was the one that by default was blued out, meaning it was the active one. This isn't sorted in here. If we wanted to sort it, we would have had it basically in the reverse order. American Express would have been first, then MasterCard, and then Visa. All right, then we do a similar thing with the months. Again, the select a month is our zero with element. January is our one. December is our 12. And then this is adding those to that combo box. And when we get done, we're setting the default option to zero, which is select a month. All right, then we're doing some stuff that we've done a little bit at least in a previous chapter. Notice we're setting the year equal to date time dot today dot year. All right, so we're grabbing the current year. Then we're adding eight to that. We're in 2024. We add eight to it, we get to 2032. All right, and then we go from the current year 2024 to, to less than 2032. And that's going to fill that combo box up. So this will fill up our months. This will fill up our years. All right, finally, when we look at this, notice again, we've got another is valid data in here. Very similar to the stuff we've already looked at. All right. And again, for the payment form, maybe I even went backwards because this is very similar to the stuff we've already done. So what I want to show you, just give me about five or 10 more minutes, and I want to show you what we're going to do tomorrow. Okay, we're going to build these from scratch, but the ones that we're going to look at, are going to be extra exercises 10-1, 10-2, and 10-3. We're going to do all three of these. This is the first one. Okay. We'll go smaller and get rid of this. There we go. So we're going to be converting lengths. We can go in any of these six ways. Miles to kilometers, kilometers to miles, feet to meters, meters to feet, inches to centimeters or centimeters to inches. I set up constants with these values. All right. And we're going to take these, or for example, meters to feet, uh, feet to meters, etc. We're going to put all those into a combo box. All right. This, we can select a drop down in there, anyone we want. And this is where we're going to input something. All right. So if we want meters to feet, that means that 500 meters is equal to 1,640.40 feet. All right. If we go here from meters to feet, it's 3.2808. So that's saying that 500 times 3.2808 is going to give us 1640.04. And every time we change this, these labels that are here will change as well. 
So to show you that one, the one that we will create tomorrow, if I can find it. I think it's in here. Yes, it is. Let's go up to here. This is 10 1. That's it, and you'll notice right now it says miles to kilometers, but we haven't done anything yet. So if we change this to kilometers to miles and we put a number in here, kilometers to miles, all right? Now, after we've done it once, now it'll change for us automatically. But really what I should have done, I guess I didn't do, we'll do this tomorrow, is I should take these and both zero them out because we just changed. Now, if we if we click it again, I guess it did do it. All right. So meters to feet. If I come in here and put in something else. All right. If I go back and change it to meet to feeders, meet to feeders, feet to meters, you can notice how the it's changing right away. All right. So we're going to do that one first tomorrow. Then. This is probably amongst the most challenging ones you've done all semester because if you look at the interface, all right, we've got three group boxes. The first group box says main course. It has three radio buttons in it. If we choose hamburger like you see right there, in our add-ons, we're going to have this right here. If we choose pizza, we're going to get three different add-ons in here. And if we choose salad, we're gonna get three different add-ons in here. In addition, for pizza, the add-ons aren't a buck and a quarter. They're, I think, 75 cents each. And for the salad, the add-ons are gonna be 50 cents each. So based on what we choose here, that's going to change both the value we have in here and what we have in here, all right? So it's just gonna be a pick and choose type of thing. And after we do that, we click place order. So if you look at this example that we have here, a hamburger is 795, all right? Um, the add-ons are a buck 25 each. There's two add-ons, so it's 250. 795 and 250 is 1045. If I take 1045 and apply 7.75% tax to it, I get 81 cents. If I add 1045 and 81, I get 1126. All right, so to quickly look at that one, which is 102. All right, so if I go to pizza, Notice how all this changes. If I go back to burger, it changes again. If I go to salad, it changes the third time. So if I go to salad right now for 650 and I have no add-ons, it's 650. I know that I made the print in here a little small, but the tax is 50 cents, so it's seven dollars. If I come in and start adding add-ons and I do it again, now it's eight dollars. I got three add-ons at 50 cents each, so a buck 50 plus 650 is $8. All right, so you can see how all of this stuff is working. But again, every time we change one of the radio buttons, what's going to change is the amount that's here and these three checkboxes, the text for the checkboxes changes every time. All right, so that is the second one that we will be working on tomorrow. And then finally, for the third one, this is adding a second form. I don't like this example, but we're going to do this one anyway. We've done this kind of thing many times before, where you set this up 
we assume that the discount amount is 10%. All right, so you multiply that by 0.1, and that's your discount amount. You take this and subtract that from it, you get a subtotal. Then you take the subtotal, multiply it by 7.75%, that's your tax total. You add your subtotal and your tax together, you get your final total. Now this change percent, if you click this button, it brings up a different form where you can change the tax percentage that you're using. And it has to be a number, I believe it's between zero and 10. So if we look quickly at that one, and that is 10.3, I don't want this one anymore, let me close that. And I don't, well, it's the other one, so. And I must have closed it, so that's okay. Let's open it up again. So again, for 10.3, right here, make that my startup and run it. And you'll notice that if I come through here, I, I put all my buttons at the bottom. They had their one of theirs on the side. So again, if I put 2250 by default and don't change anything, it's exactly what's shown in the book. All right, or in our handout here. Well, I thought it was, but evidently it's not. Oh, I put 2250. They put 225. Let's try it again. 225. Let's see if we get the same amounts. Calculate. 2250, 20250, 1569. Okay. Right now it's at 10%. If I click change percent, it brings up another form. So if I change this to 5% and click OK, then notice how that changed to 5%. This all cleared out. And if I put 225 in again, I get different numbers. All right, well, I should have, but I, yeah. The discount amount is still the same. That's 10%, but the tax has changed from 10%, so 1569 to 5%, 1013. All right, so these first three don't change, but the last two, of course, will change. So that's what we're going to do tomorrow. I'm sorry again that the period got so screwed up. Just to tell you, if you didn't hear, or maybe you care, maybe you don't, Today at the rankin Wentzville campus, they're having a job fair, all right? What happens is I get to the Rankin campus on Mondays and Thursdays. I get there at 5.30 in the morning, and I work from 5.30 to 7.30 because it's I'm the only one there, and it's quiet as heck, and I like that, all right? So at 7.30, I went over and walked over to the other building, because they're having a job fair. Normally I drive there, but I walked over there and I was told you can't broadcast out of that building today. I said, why? And they said, because um, it's being used by some of the employers, the conference room. You have to go back to the other building. Once I went back to the other building, it would not let me log in as me. There's something screwed up with the Rankin network. Like I said, we tried this for over an hour and did not get it to work. So eventually I drove home. That's where I'm broadcasting from right now. All right, there is not enough time in an hour and 20 minutes to do justice to these three problems. So tomorrow I am going to lecture, all right? If you can't make it or you don't wanna come, it'll of course be taped, all right? Will it take the entire period? No. My my guess is it'll take some time till around 10 o'clock or so. Lastly, what I'm going to send you out by the end of the day today, I think I've got it here. Let me find it. Close this. Yes. And I close this and bring this up. There we go. This will be your homework. The first one's kind of neat. We're going to do this one together. All right, I didn't write this, but I still think it's kind of neat. It's a thing on superheroes, okay? 
and don't worry about what it is. Like I said, we'll get this. These there's three more, and you're going to do these yourselves. So it'll be this one and this one. And if you remember yesterday, one of the things that I did yesterday in class for you. Was. This one and I used a date picker with it. I'm going to ask that you go back and redo this problem the way they explained it on here using. Um, text boxes instead of date pickers like I did. So that will be the last problem that you will have. I just copied it right from the book and I copied the instructions right from the book. I'll send this out today in my, my uh, email that I'll send out later today. So if you want to start working on it, you can. It's kind of cool. I've got I've got them done, but I just wanted to show you because when we work on the one with the superheroes, which I've got near someplace. And I'm going to find it. Oh, I know where it is. Um, let's see. Yeah. All right. So when we work on the superhero one, we're going to start incorporating images into our programs. All right. So I'm going to show you the one that I wrote and I'll give you all the images. It's not, you know, so this will be what comes up at the beginning and we can choose Captain America or we can choose the Incredible Hulk or we can choose Iron Man or we can choose Thor or we can choose Submariner. All right. So we'll work on all of that next week. We'll work on this problem right here that you see on Monday. After we work on it on Monday, there's probably going to be a good chance. There'll be plenty of the period left. So um, I'm going to give you a pretest, and we're going to work on that. I'm still working on that right now myself. So tomorrow there will be a lecture. I'll try to make sure that I keep it down to no more than a couple hours, but however long it takes to go over 10-1, 10-2, and 10-3, all right? So again, I apologize for the problems we have this morning. I appreciate anyone and everyone that has stuck with this, and I will see you tomorrow, and I will see you then at 8.05. Thanks. Have a good rest of the day.